Good morning, and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Hendersonville. If you've ever been reminded that the church is not just when we gather together, the church is uh, scattered all over our community, now's the time for that. We're glad you're here. Now, sitting here with me, and not too close of a fashion, because social distancing is a new word that we all know, are two of my buddies today. We've got our six feet apart here. Take you a little squirt of of uh, hand lotion Bruce get you a little over there, there we've, we've all got to stay healthy I, I've probably washed my hands more in the past uh, couple of weeks than I have in a long long time but we're glad you're here today thank you for coming to join with us we are going to be gathering for worship uh, three times this morning this of course is the 830 worship hour and uh, we're glad that you are joining with us. Bruce, we've got connect. Now you've got hand lotion. I have something to gargle with. You oh, wanna, you wanna uh, no, go? I don't need to gargle. All I'm right. good on that. Well, I'm good I've, on got, that. I've got plenty of it right there. Hey, I know for a fact that we have a lot of our Connect groups that are actually meeting this morning. Yeah, yep. my wife's uh, group that she's in uh, is meeting this morning right now. I, I think they, they are already meeting. If, if your Connect group would like to try to figure out how to stay connected with video during these trying days our team here at the church wants to help you with that if you would contact Jerry Woolley uh, in the adult education office he can help you and your group uh, find ways you could do it uh, on Facebook you could do it with zoom there are a number of different platforms that are available and uh, these guys will help you with any number of them a lot of them are already doing that but tell, tell them about the the one that we offer and it's there all the time it's not just during this season it's always online we've been doing this for several months now but we have a connect group or the, this this bible study lesson that goes online every sunday morning you can uh, see it uh, on our website it just simply says uh, uh, Bible, a live stream Bible study lesson. Uh, Jerry Woolley is, uh, over the next few weeks, will be teaching that each week. We'll be using our curriculum. We're in the book of Romans right now. Uh, he, he taped it early this morning. It should be live right now. Yep. Joe Huffines usually teaches that, but Joe is kind of uh, like a lot of people right now. He's uh, self-isolated. He's had some health issues and, and doesn't need to come to the church every week to tape it. So Jerry's doing Jerry's it during doing it this. Jerry's doing it for the next few weeks. Yeah, during this interim time. Do you think we should tell them about the new technology? I think technology is wonderful. We've, we've talked about Facebook. We've talked about Zoom. We've talked about all this other. But we found some new technology this week yeah, that well, is incredible. What you may not know is that our guys figured out this week how not only can you see us, but right now we can see you too. We see you sitting there in your pajamas. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't turn off the computer. Don't run and hide. We cannot see you. Uh, but I, I did have a lot of people tell me last week that they uh, they watched in their pajamas. Yeah, probably more than what we would want to know. My wife last night said, what am I going to wear to church tomorrow? And then she said, oh, I know my pajamas. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, Pastor, uh, we're, we're taking it week by week. Yeah. But what everyone is telling us is this may continue on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, we certainly want to... Uh, do what they're asking us to do, uh, try to contain this virus. We're, we're praying, but we also have to do those things that, that we need to do. We miss, and we have heard from so many people this week that missed physically being at church and grateful for the live stream, uh, but uh, we have some ideas that are floating around that maybe we can do something different in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, there are a lot of moving parts to this, but uh, when it first happened, I started thinking, well, how can, we, how can we do something where our people can at least see each other? So we are trying, and, and again, there are a lot of moving parts. We've ordered some equipment this week, 
we are shooting toward trying to have what we're calling drive-in church on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday and uh, we'll have a, a, a raised platform where I can be and folks all over the parking lot can see we're trying to get an FM transmitter that uh, you just tune to a channel and you'll be able to a station you'll be able to listen to the music that Greg will lead and the, the, the message that I'll give now you can't get out of your car and you can't go and see people but but you can wave and you can see people that way and just being here you know it's a wonderful thing so we're, we're still trying to get all the pieces in place and it's not some small churches can just set up a sound system we can't do that yeah. our neighbors probably would not appreciate that <laughs> it would take a pretty big sound system. it would take a big sound system <laughs> but that's this is a great prayer request to pray that God would just put all of these elements in place that we could do that and gather on those uh, uh, on those special Sundays I also want to share that you're going to be actually continuing your Revelation Bible study yep. beginning yep. this Wednesday night I uh, our pastor is going to tape that study in the next day or so. And so Wednesday night, go to our website, look for that uh, tab, and uh, you'll be able to watch as we continue this incredible study yep. of the book of Revelation. It'll be put on 6.30 Wednesday night, regular time, but if you need to watch it later, of course, it'll be there like all the other studies are as well. To, to do any of that, any of our uh, worship services Wednesday night, anything like that, you just go to our webpage. There's a tab that says Watch. Click on that. And then you can see live stream messages from Sunday. You can see Wednesday night Bible studies. And you can click on either of those links and it takes you to all of those. Well, Bruce, we want to stay connected with trying to help people. And that's, uh, that, that is a great part of what our ministry team will be doing for these next several weeks. We are continuing to work. We are continuing to try to keep people connected and help people. I actually had some people that took me up on my offer last week of toilet paper. By the way, I heard what's happened to all the toilet paper. I, I, I couldn't figure it out. But someone said that the rapture has come and the roll has been called up yonder. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, we do want to continue to help people. And we want to help you. And if, if you have a need that we can help with, please, please call and let us know. Tell us a little bit about how the church has been able to stay connected and helpful and some things that have gone on this week. Well, our, our adult team, our next-gen teams have done an incredible job of pulling together a lot of resources. Uh, one thing I want to share is our next-gen team has put together a website that has resources for parents, uh, for students. Uh, it'll go live uh, tomorrow morning. It's hvillefamily.com. There you'll be able to find some songs that you can, you can sing together, to worship together. You'll find some downloadable pages for children. Our students are going to be meeting uh, for a virtual time of Bible study, just like we're doing right here this morning as well. So hbillfamily.com will roll out tomorrow morning. Our adult team as well uh, has worked hard to uh, provide, continue to provide the meals for our backpack ministry. Uh, we send meals home to about 600 kids each week from schools because the schools are still out. Uh, they have found a creative way to get that food to the children. And so uh, we sent home backpacks this week that those children will get. We'll continue to do that uh, as long as school is out. Uh, we have non-perishable foods that have been purchased here. As we hear of needs uh, within our community, we have people that have volunteered to take that. Uh, we're calling our senior adults to check on them. So many other ways ministry is taking place week by week. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to be sure if you uh, to read the daily e-connects. The pastor, every morning, 7 o'clock, a devotional goes out. It helps me start my day in the Word of God with a devotional thought, a prayer time. Uh, and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, another one's going out that's telling about what's happening within the church at this particular time. And so it keeps people informed of what's going on. You can sign up for the eConnect on our webpage. It's a very simple thing to do. It's just a little form that you'll fill out, and you'll start getting uh, eConnect. We're having calls from some people already that have lost jobs. Yes. Uh, we've had contact from some churches that are having some significant issues at a lot of different levels that we're going to be trying to help with. So uh, this is bigger than uh, anything we've, you know, the flood as big as that was, the tornado is impactful as that is but this is just it's called a pandemic for a it's reason. affecting every part yeah. of our society and 
there's certainly uh, a lot of changes that we've all made because of it and will continue to make. Uh, there's certainly the negative side, but if there's a positive side that's come out of that, it, it's put us on our knees. Yeah. And, and Pastor, this morning, as, as before we continue on with our music worship, uh, uh, let's pray together, ask you to pray, and I want to ask you as a family, wherever you are right there, would you pray? And perhaps even just pray aloud as our pastor is praying this morning uh, that, that God would draw us closer to him and people will see Jesus Christ through all of this. I sure will. I've, I've asked, too, that every day when you get that 7 a.m., E-Connect, and when you get that 4 p.m. E-Connect, use that as a reminder to pray for our church, our community, our state, our nation, and our world. Uh, let's, let's flood um, the halls of heaven with our prayers in the days that are ahead. Let me pray right now. Father, thank you that you've heard us. Thank you that you care about us. Thank you, Lord, that this did not catch you by surprise. Not one time did you ever say, Oh, no, I did not see this coming. Nothing's caught you by surprise. Nothing has you backed into a corner. And the reality is that if, if we recover from this and we come out on the other side, God will be praised. Jesus is Lord. If the worst scenario happens and the end of the world occurs, Jesus is Lord, and we will reign with you forever and ever in the place you've prepared. Either way, we win. Thank you, Lord, for the provision that you made for us a long time ago in Jesus Christ. And I pray now that as we enjoy some music of our faith, that this would be a time of worship for all of us. We are not together physically but we are together spiritually. So may this be a true worshipful experience, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Greg? Well, we've talked about ways that you can get connected through uh, our media, and, and one thing we're working on for those choir members that are watching this morning is we're trying to work out where we can do a virtual choir rehearsal and have the best night of the week uh, this coming Wednesday, but we'll let you know more about that uh, as that progresses. Now, this morning, we have two songs that we're going to uh, play for you. The first one is Greater Than Great. Our God is deeper than deep, wider than wide, and our God can do anything. And you listen as the choir and orchestra play along that one. And then also, right before the message, uh, Dr. Chesser's new favorite song, All My Hope is in Jesus. Thank God yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven, and I'm washed in the blood of, of the God that we serve. He is a great God and worship with us today as we sing together these great songs.
boys and girls. I'm so glad we get to meet you online like this. I miss seeing your faces, but it's great that we get to talk to you this way. This morning, Mr. Mark and I have a message just for you kids. We're going to talk to you about life changes and how sometimes that can be exciting or sometimes a little nervous. You know, we change every day. Our bodies change every day, and we go through that. Sometimes we change in ways. Maybe we move to a new home, or we start a new school, or go to a new town, and sometimes that can be a little nervous. Or sometimes we have good changes, like one year we love soccer, and then the next year we decide, you know what, we really love basketball. Those are great changes that we can go through, but then sometimes, like today, we can be going through changes that are, make us a little nervous. Maybe you don't get to come and spend time here with your friends or go to school. Or you go to the grocery store and your favorite things aren't there right now. And that can make you feel a little nervous. Well, you know what? We're going to talk to you today about how God can take care of us during those times. That's right. You know, life is filled with changes, as she just mentioned. But we can know that God never changes. We can always trust Him. Just think about who God is. He's the creator of the universe. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing, and he's right here for us each and every day. Psalms 46.1 reminds us that God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. That's who God is for us. When we're facing a tough time, a tough change in life, we can show either faith or fear. Faith says, I'm going to trust God no matter what. And fear says, I think I can do this on my own. I won't trust God yet. Which of those do you think is the best, boys and girls? Faith, of course, is, is the answer. We've got an illustration here that we want to uh, use to help uh, show this truth. We've got some olive oil in this container, and Miss Melissa is going to pour about that much water on top of the oil. And then she's going to add some food coloring to help us see a little better about what's going to happen. She's putting the lid on. She's going to shake it up really good. It's all mixed up. It's a mess. And Miss Melissa, tell us an awesome story about, uh, about faith versus fear. All right. Well, you know, this does, it reminds me of a great story in the Bible. And you can find this story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And in this story, we find a, a woman whose husband has just passed away. And she's left with her two sons. And now one day a man comes and, and she owes money to this man. And, but she doesn't have the money to pay him. So she goes to the prophet Elisha in town. And she tells him her problems. And he says, well, what do you have to, to pay this man? And she says, you know, all I have is a little bit of olive oil. He says, okay, what I want you to do is you and your sons to go to your neighbors and your friends and collect as many jars as you can find, empty jars. Take them back to your house and go in and close the door and take a jar and fill them with the oil that you have. And then... Um, do and see what happens. And so she and her sons do that. She takes the little bit of oil that she has and begins to fill the first jar. And it, then it fills all the way up. So then she calls and gets another jar and they fill up the next jar. They keep doing this until all of the jars are filled. And by the last jar, she runs out of oil at that moment. Well, then she goes back to Elisha and she tells him what has happened. And he says, all right, what I want you to do is to take that oil and go and pay back the man that you owe him the money to. And then whatever is left, that is what you will live off of. So it's just amazing how God can take something so small that we're so scared of and do something amazing with that. That is an amazing story, how the, how the widow trusted God through Elisha. Well, let's see what has happened to our illustration here. As you probably suspected, boys and girls, the oil and the water have separated. You see the water at the bottom. The water represents our fears that we have in life, and the oil represents faith that we have in God. And if we trust God, he can help us push our fears away. You know, sometimes life shakes us up, and our faith and our fear gets all mixed together, and we're not sure how to respond. But we'll just trust God. We can rise above our fear and trust God with faith. Remember that verse, uh, Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. So I ask you this morning, boys and girls, where are you living your life? Are you down here in worry and fear about what's going on around you today? Or have you risen above that and you're trusting God and living by faith? We say, let's live by faith and let's not live by fear. Thank you, Mr. Mark and Miss Melissa. 
each week as we come together we also worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings of course we're not to gather and, and so we can't do it the way we normally uh, do it but want to thank you for those that uh, went on our website and uh, you gave through uh, through the the tab that simply says give on the website uh, many people mailed in uh, their tithes and offerings this week brought them by the church office thank you so much for your support uh, I say thank you not only on behalf of our church but on behalf of the missionaries around the world and our mission partners in Guatemala and New York City and Madison so that their ministries can continue during this time as well let's pray together as we pray right now let's pray specifically for our pastor in just a moment after our next music worship uh, he'll be coming he'll be opening God's word would you at pray for our pastor but pray for yourself that God would speak to you specifically this morning let's pray our father this morning we thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship uh, through this means uh, of the internet today uh, through our website through Facebook live Lord, we thank you for the hundreds of people that are engaging right now I pray blessings upon each one of them Lord I pray protection upon them upon their health I pray you'll meet every one of their needs Lord thank you for meeting our needs as a congregation you've always done so through the 75 year history of our church and we know you'll always do so but father now as we prepare ourselves to receive your word Lord, would you speak through our pastor, give him a strong, special anointing of your Holy Spirit this morning to deliver the message that you have given him. Prepare us to receive that message so that we will truly have been transformed through your word this morning. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen.
What a song. What a song. Those of us that are gathered here were worshiping just now. I hope you were worshiping wherever you are. You know, you can't get any better than singing about the blood of the Lord Jesus. That's why the world doesn't want us to sing about the blood or talk about the blood because there's power in the blood. There's power in the name of Jesus. I've been in contact with a lot of pastors this week. Uh, we have a network. We stay connected with each other and pray for each other and encourage each other and all those things. And uh, it seems to me, as I've talked to people this week, that uh, the way pastors are handling this is about 50-50. About half of the pastors have abandoned what they were planning to preach and maybe a series that they were going through, a study that they were in, and they've turned to a passage that deals with discouragement or maybe tribulation or just a passage on encouragement something along those lines and that's so understandable and that's appropriate and if that's the way the Lord leads that's exactly what uh, they need to do but about half the pastors have done what I've done I just think that you need some normalcy in your life right now the world's been turned upside down you're not where you usually are on Sunday mornings uh, you may not have been able to be out of the house much this week, and everything has just kind of gone haywire in our world. And I think that this hour should be uh, as normal as possible. Uh, Wednesday nights, we're going to continue with our study like we've been doing. We're going to continue in our study in 2 Corinthians. We'll study today and next week and the next, and then we're finished with 2 Corinthians. We'll, we'll uh, celebrate the resurrection, whether we do it this way or with a drive-in church, however we do that. We'll uh, celebrate the resurrection on Easter, and then the week after we'll start a study in the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to where we would be if we were gathered together today. We'll turn to the same passage, and ironically, in both last week's passage and this week's passage, Sovereign God has embedded in these passages something that's very very relevant and very very appropriate for what we're going through during these troubling days now we're coming to the end of the 12th chapter and Paul has turned his thoughts once again to the idea of the relationships that he has with these Corinthian Christians that's been broken it, it's really been um, strained and and all of his writing in second corinthians has been dealing with that he wants to have a relationship with these people he wants it to be good he loves these people if you've ever been a part of a church start a church plant whether you were the pastor or a charter member you will always have an affinity for that church you will always love that church you will always want that church to prosper and Paul wanted the best for this church he wanted the best for these people he wanted to see God at work in them and through them and 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 that comes out throughout uh, everything that he's written in this book now you know the reality is and if you've been a part of a church for very long you know that this is true all churches have squabbles all churches have issues and I think that it is a truism to say, now all truisms have uh, outliers, there are always exceptions to every rule, but I think, I think this is true to say that the smaller the church, the more public the squabble. The smaller the church, the fewer the people, the, the greater the chance that everybody knows about it. It may not have been in their area of ministry, it may not have personally involved them or impacted them but they know about it the smaller the church the more likely that everybody knows about these issues and problems when they occur the larger the church the less public it is and the reality is that in a church our size that there could be a an issue a difficulty and only a, a certain group in a ministry area might know about it or a leadership team uh, it just it, it's, it's more limited but every church has squabbles and every church has issues now in this book we're coming toward the end of it so let me just remind you that Paul in a sense has been on trial his accusers have been these false teachers and they've said all kinds of things about him that have caused him to defend himself now he never at any point I find this interesting he never said here are the charges that have been leveled against me and here are my responses to those charges he never just made us a list of those but if you've been keeping up with them, you've been hearing them as we've gone through this book, let me remind you of a few things that they've said about him. They said that he was trying to exploit the church. Paul said, not guilty. 
I'm not trying to exploit anybody. I'm, I'm not trying to get anything out of you. I'm trying to help you. I, I planted that church with my sweat and blood. I lived among you there for, for all of those many months. I, I became one of you. I haven't wanted to exploit you but to help you. There was a point when we were back in the middle of the book, I think about chapter 9 along in there, where he dealt with the, the, the accusation. They said that his ministry must not have any value because he had not asked them to support it. And if he had not asked them to support it, it must be without value. Now, that, that came from their understanding in their day that when there was a spiritual leader, a religious leader, if you would, they all had disciples. And their disciples would support them. And so they just, they just decided, they discerned that if Paul was not asking them to support him, that, that his ministry must not have any value. Paul defended himself by saying, Look, I was, I was not wanting to be a burden to you. He's going to say that again in the passage I'm about to read. I didn't want to be a burden to you. The fact is, Paul always knew that the ministry was worthy of being supported and he knew that the laborer was worthy of his hire and that that supporting the, the the work of the church and the ministry that's very very biblical it's so important but see what paul was doing he was allowing the healthier churches the church at thessalonica the church at philippi the church at ephesus the churches of galatia he was allowing them to support him while he did that work in Corinth and he never called on the Corinthians to do that now had they become healthy had they become strong in their faith maybe he would have gone to plant another church and he would have allowed them to help him in that regard but he defended himself by saying I didn't want to be a burden to you they accused him of being a lousy preacher now I'll tell you that's hitting a preacher below the belt that is that's a low blow when you say to a preacher you're a lousy preacher and they added insult to injury they not only said you're a lousy preacher they said you're not much to look at either now he never defended himself about the looks you know there's not much you can do about that we clean ourselves up the best we can but we are what we are he didn't defend himself about his Looks, whether it was his height or his width or whatever it might have been, he made no defense of that. But about his oratory skills, while he would acknowledge that he was probably not a world-class public speaker, he said, what I'm telling you is relevant and it is God's truth. It is God's word to you. All the way back in chapter 1, they said he was fickle. Remember that charge? He was fickle. They said, you made plans and then changed your mind. Paul said, look, I, I didn't change my mind because I had a better opportunity. I didn't change my mind because it fit my schedule better. I changed my plans for your benefit. It was for your good. It was for you. He, he's defending himself uh, through this they, they charged him with not having the proper credentials and Paul referred to those super apostles and this is what he said they may have some kind of credentials that you think puts them on a superior plane but my credentials are that I have been persecuted and I have suffered I have been beaten I have been thrown in prison in the name of the Lord Jesus you want credentials those are my credentials and then they said, well, you don't have any revelations. You don't have any visions that have come to you. Every good super apostle has a vision. And Paul said, we studied this in the first part of chapter 12 just a couple of weeks ago. Paul said, you want a vision. Let me tell you about a vision that I had 14 years ago. And I haven't even mentioned it. I haven't even brought it up because I didn't want to be boastful. I didn't want to put the spotlight on me. I didn't want it to be about me. And even when he told the story, he told it in third person because of the humility of his spirit. You want a vision? Let me tell you what God did 14 years ago. He took me to heaven. He let me see heaven. You want a vision? I'll give you a vision. Now, all of that is the defense that's been going on throughout the book of 2 Corinthians. And, and there are other things that they've, charges that they've leveled and the way he's defended himself. But now, in the passage that I'm about to read, he shifts his strategy for the first time. Now, rather than being on the defensive, now he takes the offense. 
Now he says something directly to them. And so the tone here changes. His strategy changes. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 12, verse 11. And we'll actually read down into the first few verses of the 13th chapter. I hope you have a Bible with you. This is what it says. I have become a fool. You forced it on me. I should have been endorsed by you since I am not in any way inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of an apostle were performed with great endurance among you, not only signs, but also wonders and miracles. So in what way were you treated worse than the other churches, except that I personally did not burden you? Forgive me for this wrong. Now I'm ready to come to you, This third time, I will not burden you, for I'm not seeking what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for you. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Now granted, I have not burdened you, yet sly as I am, I took you in by deceit. Did I take advantage of you by anyone I sent? You, I urged Titus to come to you, and I sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Didn't we walk in the same spirit and in the same footsteps? You have thought all along that we were defending ourselves to you. No, in the sight of God, we are speaking in Christ, and everything, dear friends, is for building you up. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I will not find you to be what I want and I may not be found to be what you want there may be quarreling jealousy outburst of anger selfish ambition slander gossip arrogance and disorder I fear that when that 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 when I come my my God will again humiliate me in your presence and I will grieve for many who sinned before and have not repented of the moral impurity sexual immorality and promiscuity they practiced this is the third time I'm coming to you Every fact must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I gave a warning when I was present the second time, and now I give a warning while I'm absent to those who sinned before and to all the rest. If I come again, I will not be lenient, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. He is not weak toward you, but powerful among you. In fact, he was crucified in weakness, but he lives by God's power. For we also are weak in him, yet toward you we live with him by God's power. Wow, what a great passage. Now, you know, we could take hours and go through an exegetical study of every one of these verses. There is so much here. So much. Uh, If you look in verse 11, he says, uh, I I have become a fool. You forced it on me. He, He is saying that his friends have... Uh, put him in an impossible situation they've made this very difficult and these are people that he calls his friends these are people that are a part of his church it's a very difficult time down in verse 12 and 13 14 along in there what he's basically saying is that the church at Corinth had adopted a world view of what of what spiritual success looks like you can't do that you just can't do that spiritual success is not just determined by numbers and by things that the world looks at and the world says, okay, this person is successful and this person is not. You can't use a worldly system to judge spiritual things. And he's saying in these verses, that's exactly what what they have done. He says down in verse uh, 15, look at the end of the 15th verse. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? In other words, they've withheld love from him. They've withheld this relationship with Paul. They, this, this thing is all out of balance. And then he comes down toward the end of the passage, the end of that particular chapter, and he reminds them in verse 19 that everything I've done is for building you up. I want the best for you. Now, he mentions something twice in these verses. If we were doing a deep exegetical study which is a lot easier to do in person than it is in the uh, platform that we're using today but if we were doing that kind of study we could spend a lot of time he mentioned it in chapter 12 in the first verse of chapter 13 he says this is the third time that I've come to you we could talk about that 
We know when he established the church, but what about the second and the third time? There's a, there's a lot of meat on the bone there that we could discuss. That, that, that's all kind of an overview of the exegesis, and there's so much there. But let me tell you what, what I really want you to hear today. There are three principles. Oftentimes I'll say, okay, here's the exegesis, here's the history, here's what the Bible says, but so what? How does that play out in our lives? What does that mean for us? How am I supposed to apply this? So let me give you three very practical applications of this passage. Here's the first. Always value people more than possessions. Always value people more than possessions. Now, he says that in this passage. Look in verse 14. At the end of the verse, he says, For I am not seeking what is yours. In other words, not what, it's not what you have that I'm looking for, but you. I'm not looking for what you have. I'm looking for you. Paul valued people more than he did possessions. Now, if there has ever been a time in our lives when we have been made starkly aware that the church is not this building, it is now. We're not able to gather together the things that we've done every week, many of us every week of our lives, and we've taken it for granted, and now we're not able to do it. Hear me say today that God blessed this church tremendously 29, 30 years ago when God made it available that the First Baptist Church of Hendersonville could move from that old location down on West Main Street to this wonderful new 40-acre campus here. God blessed this church incredibly. But I'm telling you that if a tornado came through here tonight and if a tornado wiped out every piece of wood and every brick and took out every inch of every floor of every wing of this building and there was nothing left but a slab that is not the first baptist church of hendersonville and the church will not have been harmed because this church is not pews and plaster and bricks the church is people Remember the old thing we used to do as children? Here's the church and here's the steeple. Open the doors and here's the people. Listen, it's not the, it's not the building that makes us the church. It's the people that make us the body of Christ. That's why it's so important that we stay connected. I don't know if you noticed it or saw it, but this week on Facebook and Twitter and our church webpage, I, I had our media team design a little thing that, that uh, it was, I think it was rolling before the service started today. It, it showed a picture of our beautiful campus on the top, and, and, and then there, were the, there was the caption that said, This is not the church. And underneath were a picture, was a picture of dozens, maybe hundreds of faces of boys and girls and parents and grandparents, old and young and black and white, people of all ages and stations in life with the caption underneath those hundreds of pictures that says, this is the church. That's what Paul tells us in this passage. I'm not interested in what you have. I'm interested in you. If there's a principle we take out of this passage, it is that people are more important than possessions. Never forget that. Never forget that. The second thing comes out of the 13th chapter. And I won't take time to go all through it. You heard it as I read it a moment, a moment ago. Paul actually goes back to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18. And this, this is the principle that he's giving us. Where a relationship has been broken, it's been broken with him in Corinth. Do everything within your power to see that relationship restored. He he quotes Jesus, take two or three witnesses, try to restore the relationship. Now hear me say something. It takes two people to have a broken relationship. If there's just one person, there's no relationship to be broken. But where there are two people, it takes two people for a relationship to be broken. And for the relationship to be restored, it also takes two people. And so you do everything you can. That's the principle of Matthew 18. That's the principle of 1 Corinthians 13, you do everything you can to restore those relationships because people matter more than possessions. Now the third principle that I want you to see in this passage is really down in about verse 14, 15, 16, all the way really down to verse 18. He talks about parents and he talks about children and then down in verse 18 he refers to Titus and he calls him his brother. It is a reminder that we're family. Now, Paul saw himself as the father of the church in Corinth. I'm not the father of this church. Now, I'm not even the head of this church. At best, I'm the under-shepherd. The Lord Jesus is the head of this church. 
but we are his body there is a reason why so many times in scripture that the bible talks about the church being the body of christ brothers and sisters that's why the Bible says, does the eye say to the hand, I don't need you? Or the foot would say to the arm, I have no need of you? We all need each other because we're a part of the body of Christ. And if there's ever been a time that we are aware of how much we need each other, it is today. When I was a little boy at West Highland Baptist Church in Andalusia, Alabama, Many, many Sundays, I, I, I really would say almost every Sunday, particularly Sunday mornings, I don't know that we did this at night as much, I don't remember, but many, many Sundays we would close after the preacher had preached, we'd had all the music and we'd had an invitation and it was time to go, and he would ask us to all hold hands and we'd spread out across the aisle, I remember doing it as a little boy, we'd all spread out and hold hands. And we would sing this song. I think I've probably sung this song a thousand times or more in my life. But it has never meant any more to me than it means today. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet. Till we meet till we meet at Jesus' feet. God be with you till we meet again. Let me lead you in prayer. Father, thank you for the principles of the passage, for the truth of your word. Remind us that people really are what matter the most. And as difficult as these days are when we can't go to our church, we can't go to our group, we can't do the things that we enjoy so much. Remind us that we are the body of Christ. And whether we are gathered or scattered, we are one in the spirit of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the time we've had to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Bruce. Pastor, thank you so much. Isn't it incredible? months even years a couple years ago when God laid on your heart to preach through this passage of scripture that to that me that passage would be for today couldn't be any better I mean God's in control isn't yeah, he yeah. always has been always will be we're the church and let's be the church I want to encourage you this week uh, ask in your prayer time who do you need to call who do you need to check on uh, check on your neighbors. Check on people in your connect group. Let's support one another. In this time that we're being asked to kind of contain ourselves, isolation is an issue that a lot of people, uh, they, they really struggle with. and They need other people in their lives. So let's connect with each other in the ways that we can, by phone, by email, by text. Let's check on one another, love one another, and in all of it, let's share Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Uh, we'll see you again very soon.